Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm going to start in on 1 Thessalonians 2. Um, and Paul says, For you yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi. We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we are allowed of God to be tr put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. And I think about in the first chapter where he says, he says, um, Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. When you cannot offer a, a gospel which is in power, you have to resort to deceit, uncleanness, and guile. Which is, which is bearing a burden on somebody's conscience to zealously affect them that they would be affected back towards you. It's not, it's not, it's not liberty. You know, Paul, he said, I, if I, I think it's in Galatians, he talks about if he, if he allows circumcision then the gospel, the cross, the offense of the cross is made of no effect. The offense towards the, towards the carnal man is that God has judged carnal men. God has judged all of our works as being nothing more than filthy rags. And that is... And that is exactly how he dealt with our flesh. He crucified us with Christ. The offense of the cross is that we all need to go to the cross. And we have been crucified with Christ. When you believe the gospel, you have been crucified with Christ. Which basically means God's putting an end to you. And it's freedom. It's real liberty. The cross is our entrance into the rest because we're ceasing from dead works. It's repentance from dead works and faith towards God. That's what happens at the cross. We don't seek to be established in our own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of faith. Or else the, the cross of Christ is made of no effect. There's no offense to the cross. The cross is offensive. Because it, it reproves the righteousness of men and shows them God's judgment on the flesh. There's nothing that you can do to be pleasing to God in your flesh. There's nothing that God needs you to do to clean yourself up. God made a way for the filthiest sinners so that if anyone, no matter what their state or their course or their manner of walking in this world, if they would believe that Jesus died for their sins, that person is made clean in the blood of the Lamb. They are washed in the precious blood. And they are a new creation. That is the way. His flesh is the new and living way. And that's offensive to the person who wants to make their own way. Through ordinance and through, 
through zeal and through and that is and that is what deceit and guile and uncleanness is because there's only one way to be made clean and that's the blood and the blood brings us bold to God through his flesh through the veil through through the veil which is his flesh which is crucifixion it is our death in his death and our raising to newness of life in his raising to newness of life this 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 new and living way it is death and resurrection which means that there's nothing you need to do except for die and that's already been accomplished so there's nothing that you can add to it there's there's really no part that you play other than you just hear the word and believe. But there is a responsibility on man to believe what God has spoken regarding his son. To receive the word. And this word is foolishness to the world, but it is power. It is the word in power. So to reprove the righteousness of men and preach the cross of Christ that liberty, to declare the liberty and the free gift of salvation is preaching the word in power. And he says, we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. The gospel doesn't please men. It's not, you know, he said... It, Paul would say somewhere else that if I was looking to please men, I wouldn't be a servant of Christ. This gospel is offensive. He's not looking to please men, to gain approval, to be held in men's persons favorably, but instead to preach Christ crucified. And, the, and he wants to remind them of the entrance, that it wasn't in vain. And when I think about vain entrance, a vain entrance unto them, it would just be a, an entrance in, in, in the flesh. What is the flesh? It is, it, it's when you trust in your own ability, your own craftiness, your own technique in order to change people. Sanctification and and and, and the power of God unto salvation, which is a, it's a continuing work. You know, when we believe the gospel, we are saved, but there is also a way in which we are the salvation of our soul is an ongoing daily washing where we enter rest and we recognize the truth today as we hear it today and to enter in, in to enter into the Thessalonians in vain would be to deny the power and to it would be to deny the power you know, there's those who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power. This is people who don't understand the power of the gospel as simple spoken words being resurrection life. It is the speaking of Jesus Christ, which is, it is God himself in the word. It's him. The words are more than just words. They are resurrection life. It is what John calls in 1 John the word of life. And I think about in 1 John where it says, These three bear witness in the earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. The blood is the purchase of the redemption. It is the payment for sins. It is what makes us white as snow clears our guilt, shows that justice 
has been accomplished. And the water is his work as a man. It is his work as a man. Jesus became a man. The word became flesh. And as a man, he went to death and resurrection. He went into death, even the death on the cross. You know, when you think about baptism, and this is what I think about with, with the water. I think about baptism. You know, um, baptism is a type of, of, you know, you go into the water as dying with Christ. And this shows that it's repentance from dead works. That is the concept of baptism. It's not us making a determination to serve God and to muster up as much strength. No, it's a, it's a reproval of our strength, showing that the flesh is weak and profits nothing. There is nothing good that dwells in my flesh. There, there is nothing good that dwells in my flesh. So going into the water is a type of judgment. It's death. Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. He brought the human race into death in his body on the cross. And it was judged. The first, all who were in Adam, Jesus Christ died the death. And baptism, this water, I believe it speaks about his work that he accomplished in dying, but also the river of living water, this new life that springs up out of the grave and ascends to the throne of God to sit down on his throne. And we, in the same way, being in Christ, go into death with him, and are raised to newness of life, to be seated with Christ in heavenly places. So I talked about the blood and the water. The water, you know, it's, I believe it's so necessary. This water, this living water, it washes us and renews our mind. And I do also want to talk about, you know, this. It, it says the spirit, the water, and the blood. You know, Jesus Christ, he said, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send you another comforter. Spirit of truth, who will lead you into all truth. And he will not speak of himself, but he will glorify me. The spirit bears witness to Christ. The word which speaks from heaven. Which says better things than that of Abel. His blood speaks. He, he is the word and he speaks. It's like a stream. The spirit, the water, and the blood. It is a stream. Which is out of heaven to the earth which connects us with the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now the Spirit is bearing record in heaven and bearing record in the earth, bearing record of Jesus Christ, His blood, His work, and His nature, who He is. He declares to us who Jesus Christ is in mercy and grace and the peace that we have with God because of what he accomplished. This is the power of the gospel, is that it brings us into God himself. The Spirit, to be in the Spirit, Paul would say, you are no longer in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. 
To be in the Spirit is to hear Him who speaks from heaven. By how? how? Through the foolishness of preaching. By His Spirit in His church. To receive the gospel, the testimony of the blood of of the work of Jesus Christ in the flesh through death and resurrection and to receive the word of his of who he is his nature his promises is not just connection to the spirit here in the earth the holy spirit here in the earth but it is connection to the spirit who bears record in heaven that's why we were we are brought into into God and baptized by the Spirit. There's one baptism. This is a spiritual baptism by the hearing of faith, by hearing of the blood, the finished work, resurrection life, and a Christ who sits enthroned in heaven with his with his Father, even on the throne of God. And so we are brought in to God himself by this witness. So we have to continue to hear. That's just a side note of something that I see in the witness of God in the earth, this gospel of our salvation and and what it, what it does and how I mechanically think about this is that it's a stream, the spirit, the water, and the blood, which is out of heaven from the word, from the Father to the Word in the Spirit. And that Spirit and the water and the blood are being testified in the earth. Um, it's something that you can meditate on and, and really think about. I really do see the, the, that verse as being something that's so jam packed, full of so much, so much, um, but the work is already accomplished. That's, that's, that's the truth of our liberty is that we're so free. We're so free. And that's how we stand fast in our liberty, is to recognize the work of Jesus Christ in the flesh, the blood that speaks on our behalf, and the Spirit which is in us, which we've been joined to, been sealed with, been raised with, been raised in, which is in us and we are in Him. We are in Christ and Christ is in us. So by this by this testimony, we are seated in heavenly places and the and the testimony of of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, which is in heaven is also in us on the earth. I believe this witness is what restrains. But as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, or a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately, affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not only not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. 
this letter's tender and caring where Paul says, you know, you have our you have our our own souls. We we have given you even even our own souls, our own affection. We care for you. We pray for you. Because you're dear to us. And he wants to remind them. You remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we wouldn't be chargeable to any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. We didn't want to add any burdens to you. We didn't want to make your situation difficult. We didn't want to... We didn't want to... hang a price over your head in order to receive us and receive the gospel. And res- and this is in contrast to those who were chasing after Paul and going to each of these churches and trying to spy out the liberty and bring people into bondage. There's always a price for these false apostles. There's always a price for them that you need to Support you need to pay up first, and then we'll explain to you the doctrine that we have. You are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you. As you know, we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his children, that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto his kingdom and glory. What is the walking worthily? To acknowledge those things that are true in Jesus Christ. To walk worthily is to see what God has done on our behalf. And to see the riches of the truth in Jesus Christ. The riches of grace. To walk unworthily is to shrink back and to go into dead works. And really, this results in biting and devouring one another and being brought into bondage and all different kinds of corruption. Because you're trying to you're trying to clean up something that God has already judged in the death and resurrection of Christ. You have to recognize the work of God, the testimony of God. What God says is true. He calls those things which are not as though they are. Because it's of faith. And This truth of our death and resurrection with Christ, being raised with Him and seated in heavenly places, it's a present reality that we have to we have to take it by faith. It's hard to recognize that I'm dead. And this is where we grow in grace, is because there's a constant war in the mind. We have to keep our armor on. We have to keep the gospel as let God be true and every man a liar, including me and anything else that would try to tell me and convince my mind that God wasn't already satisfied and didn't already complete everything. He's satisfied. He is pleased with Jesus Christ and his accomplished work. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God knew what he was doing. To treat the work of Jesus Christ as unfinished work is 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 to 
you see the problem here. God preordained that this would be the way. And he's completely satisfied with the work that has been accomplished. Jesus Christ is glorified and sitting on the throne. He ascended. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. So, we recognize God has reconciled us. We've been made partakers of the divine nature by faith. And our faith is precious in that it, it joins us with Christ. It joins us with Christ and with the Father by this testimony of the Spirit, which is in the earth. It says that God has done it all. You know, I, I was listening to a message the other day about how you need to understand uh, this guy was attempting to preach the gospel and it just came out so hacked because you have to, he just said, you know, he likes to go and review the gospel um, a couple times every year with his, his kids. I'm like, man, <laughs> that, ain't, that ain't enough. I, I need the gospel every day. But he ended up not even giving the gospel. Because he said, you have to understand the gospel. You have to understand the extent of Christ's work. But he never explained the extent of Christ's work. He never talked about the death and resurrection or the blood. And what does that accomplish? His death accomplishes the circumcision of, of the flesh. It puts my flesh out of the way. It puts the law out of the way. His blood pays the price for all sin that I've ever committed or ever will commit and, and makes me unblameable because it is. It's the precious blood of Jesus Christ and God had already determined This would be the way. And it is really enough. It's enough for anyone who believes. Because it's not just any blood. It's the blood of his dear son. And this eternal life that we have. We have eternal life. The life is in His Son, and His Son is the Word. The Gospel is the Word of life. Because it shows me that the work has been accomplished. This, this pastor that I was listening to immediately turned into turned from from saying you have to understand the gospel you have to understand the extent of Christ's work he turned directly from it and began talking about works he went straight into works couldn't stay on the topic of the gospel for more than a minute and he never talked about the blood of Christ or the death and resurrection of Christ. And that's that's really what's permeated most of most of Christian teaching right now is you don't have a gospel, you don't have good news. I kept saying there's nothing you can add to God's work. It's all God's work. God has God God has done salvation and it's it's not man 
he might have been Calvinist just because of his focus. It was so, so he was so fixated on God. It's what God did. It's what God did. God, salvation is of God. But he never talked about what God did in Jesus Christ. We have to stay focused on the work of Jesus Christ and the blood. He shed his blood in death and resurrection. And it's so simple. So it's a simple message about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the blood which covers all my sins and eternal life and the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ joining us to God. But really, the Spirit doesn't testify of Himself. He, he, he will glorify Christ. So really, when we speak about the death and resurrection of Christ, His work, who He is, the promises, these precious promises that He's given, and the blood, of, uh, the blood which covers, it pays for all my sin in full. It is the power of God unto salvation. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You either believe this or you don't. You either believe that the word of God effectually worketh or you don't. Those false apostles and false teachers and all of these, a lot of these ministries, they don't believe that the word effectually works. They don't believe that the word by itself accomplishes anything. It's it's astounding the contradiction and the hypocrisy. It it's it, it makes zero sense. I honestly sometimes I just wonder how people can say the things that they say, like this pastor I watched on just some random YouTube channel, but, you know, salvation is, is of God and you have to understand the extent of Christ's work and yet immediately turn to dead works. You either believe that the word effectually works in you that the words, the simple words of the gospel give life. Or you don't. You either believe that the blood of Jesus is enough or you don't. And there's a lot of talk. And I, 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 I believe we're going to see more and more just vain talking. And dancing around the issue, I mean, it's it's been like that, where people cannot speak on the blood. They cannot speak on what Christ accomplished in, his, in the flesh. They cannot speak on his death and resurrection because they don't have the testimony. They don't believe it. They don't believe that the word is enough. They don't believe that the promise is enough. The promise the Word of God 
effectually works in us who believe. This, this promise of forgiveness and redemption and eternal life is what we lay hold of. And it's a, it's a washing of our mind that we know this is true. This is true, and it's also true in me, because the Spirit bears witness to the truth. The Spirit doesn't bear witness to me. There's nothing good in me to bear witness about. The Spirit bears witness to the truth, to those same promises, and continues to just speak Christ to me, to us. And that is God's effectual working. And it's focused on Jesus Christ, His blood, His death, and His resurrection. And this new life that came out of the resurrection, which is in me. Christ in me. And that is the hope of glory. And to recognize that is to walk worthy. To recognize the truth is to walk worthy. It's to see the vision of what God has accomplished. It is the mystery of godliness. It is this new revealed truth. Because Jesus Christ has accomplished the work. And the Spirit of truth is come. I think that's that's probably good for this morning. Um, God bless you, and uh, <laughs> take care. <laughs>